So swine flu is a form of an influenza virus. Many vertebrate animals have their own versions of influenzas. People have heard about bird flu. We obviously know about human flu. Well, guess what? Pigs get the flu too. And what's interesting is that pigs don't just get pig flus. Uh, pigs are uniquely susceptible also to bird flus and to human flu. And in the case of swine flu, what we actually have is a hybrid virus. It's a virus that is mostly swine in origin, but it has both bird and uh, human sequences in it as well. Influenza is typically spread in the form of small droplets so that as we speak to each other, as we cough and sneeze, there are little droplets that go floating out of our respiratory tract. And these droplets will travel somewhere between three and six feet. And so if you're much beyond six feet of a person, the likelihood of catching flu from them is vanishingly small. But the other thing, of course, we do as people is we touch our noses, touch our eyes, touch our mouths, and then you've got virus on your hands. And so then I walk up and I shake your hand and then you touch your nose so we can have both droplet transmission and then direct contact transmission. This virus, uh, the swine flu virus, is actually an assemblage of other viruses that we've seen before. Part bird, part pig, and part human. And this is a common phenomenon. This happens almost continuously. And it's just every now and again, we end up with a virus that has the ability to infect humans and to replicate in humans. Now, the good news so far is that this virus doesn't seem, in America, to make people terribly ill. So what's being seen in Mexico seems to be drastically different from what we're seeing in the United States. They're reporting significant levels of mortality, uh, severe disease, people with, with bad lung disease. And yet we've had now something in the neighborhood of 40 cases reported in the United States. And thus far, it's behaving much more like the influenzas that you and I know, the one that comes around in the winter, what gets referred to as seasonal influenza. Now, you know, things change in time, but so far the experiences that we've had in the United States suggest that this virus is no more virulent than what you and I are sort of used to dealing with every winter. Swine flu looks just like regular influenza, and in fact in the vast majority of cases I really don't care whether you've got swine flu or human flu uh, because you're going to get better and you'll do just fine. The symptoms are the same, uh, headache, fever, sore throat, cough, myalgias, that's sore muscles and sore joints, and especially common in children, abdominal pain and, and vomiting. Quite often children don't develop the degree of cough that adults do, but children will have a fever, runny nose, and, and may vomit. But uh, otherwise, aside from the molecular biology, the uh, swine flu is really indistinguishable from what's been circulating all winter. So there are a number of treatments. Uh, there are anti-flu virus drugs, Tamiflu, which is uh, oseltamivir, and Relenza, which is zanamivir. And these are two drugs that will block the replication of the virus. Now, these are not drugs for everybody. Uh, these are drugs that really are best reserved for people who are at either at risk of developing severe flu. For instance, if you had a patient with severe lung disease, perhaps asthma, severe heart disease, or somebody who was significantly immunocompromised, perhaps with HIV or cancer chemotherapy, then we could go ahead and use these drugs to prevent these people from getting uh, any influenza were they exposed. And then if they get influenza, we can use these as treatment. But for the average person who gets influenza, uh, Tylenol or Motrin, lots of fluid, uh, chicken soup, uh, and a little bit of TLC is really all that most people really need. Well, again, the, the approach to swine flu is the same approach that you and I have to, to any respiratory infection and influenza. And these are the things that your mother taught you. Right? Cover your mouth when you sneeze, throw away the Kleenex. 
wash your hands. If you're sick, stay home. Especially if you've got someone with a febrile illness, you want to stay home. Don't share what you've got with your friends. And then if somebody is significantly sick, then you call the doctor. And the other thing that I think is particularly important right now is that having influenza is not an automatic requirement that you head to the emergency room or to your own doctor. Use your own judgment here. That in fact the vast majority of people, be it swine flu or any other influenza, are going to do just fine with the kind of care that you get at home, uh, taking care of yourself or, or taking care of those you love. The, the idea of the face masks are of dubious benefit. Now, where are the face masks, face masks proven to work? We use face masks in the hospital. If we have a patient with proven influenza, then we do two things, and this stems out of the kinds of transmission that you and I talked about already. First off, of course, anybody with influenza is going to spray bits of virus about three to six feet. So we put a mask on to protect you if you're going to get close to that patient. Then the other thing we do is we put on gowns and gloves because if we're going to touch that patient or touch anything around them in the environment, it's important then that we have things that we can remove and then wash our hands very carefully. So gowns, gloves, and masks used together is actually quite effective at protecting people from getting influenza. But to just wear a mask without washing your hands or wearing gloves or to just wear gloves and not wear a mask sort of makes as much sense as locking one car door and not the other. You know, the, the bad guy can still get in. I don't, think, I don't think there's any reason to use face masks. And currently in Chicago, I don't think there's any reason to avoid being out in public. Uh, influenza doesn't transmit that effectively in open spaces. Most transmission occurs in places like within families or in child care centers. The first thing is we don't need to test everybody that is suspected of having influenza because by and large most of them will not have influenza. The people that need to be tested are the people who have influenza-like system uh, symptoms, fever, uh, respiratory tract disease, uh, rigors and so on, and who have been in an epidemiologic area such as Mexico City, such as Southern California, specific counties, or areas in Texas where we know uh, that swine flu cases exist. But for the average patient who shows up in an office with flu symptoms, I would treat them the way we would treat any patient with flu, which is symptomatic management, unless they are at high risk of complicated disease, and then we would discuss doing a diagnostic procedure and antivirals. So if, if, say, in a week's time we have 100 cases in the metropolitan Chicago area, it really boils down to how virulent the flu we're seeing is. If it continues its current course of not being terribly virulent, we should manage swine flu the same way we manage flu flu, which is symptomatic management. If, on the other hand, we start seeing a greater degree of virulence in the virus, if it really does start to kill people, then we have to be more concerned and more aggressive. Now, the other thing we have to remember is that each year in America, regular old flu kills between 15 and 20,000 people. So we should expect that there will be some mortality associated with this influenza virus. The real question is, is there going to be excess mortality from what you'd normally expect? One of the terms that epidemiologists will use is outbreaks, epidemics, and pandemics. An outbreak is an occurrence of disease either in a restricted population or in a restricted locale. For instance, we could have an outbreak of influenza in Chicago. And well, what we're saying then is influenza is occurring in metropolitan Chicago, but it's not occurring in St. Louis. When we talk epidemics, now we're saying that there's a high level of disease across a population, a high percentage, and this varies in diseases that are being talked about, but you might say that 10% of people or 15% of people across groups and geographies, then you have an epidemic. 
pandemic then applies a global distribution of disease. And so in the years when influenza is especially bad and widespread, these are the pandemic years where it really does cross not only national borders, but cultural groups and everything else. So the question is, will this virus really go pandemic? Hard to know, but it is interesting that in the past, most pandemic strains, when they show up, they show up big. Uh, they come rolling in, and it seems like we're nothing we can do about it. Here it seems to be sort of starting up in, in dribs and drabs. The, the essential element for a pandemic flu is efficient human-to-human -human transmission. In other words, it's not enough that the virus simply makes somebody sick, right? Bird flus do that, but bird flus don't transmit effectively human to human, and this is why we don't see bird flu pandemics. So what we're really now waiting to see is, does swine flu transmit efficiently person to person? And if the answer is no, which seems to be the case so far, then I don't think we have the recipe for a pandemic.